for, for this week in general, we won't have one. Um, we will have homework though, so there will be a homework assignment that is due next Thursday, um, which is the same day that we're going to be having our first exam. Um, but we will not have a uh, we won't have an in-class assignment that we need to uh, take any look at. Um, in addition to that, there will be an extra credit opportunity. So this extra credit opportunity is just going to be another assignment. Um, it's not posted on Canvas quite yet, but that's going to uh, either be worth an in-class assignment, so a full in-class assignment, um, or it'll be worth about half of a homework uh, assignment. So that's in the process. I'll probably post that uh, assignment either tonight or potentially sometime tomorrow, but I'll, I'll try and post it tonight just so that all of you guys will have the uh, ability to take a look at it and kind of see what it pertains to. Um, there is a homework assignment that is due tonight as well, so I want to make sure that you guys are uh, ready to do that. Uh, and if you do have any questions with regard to that homework assignment that's due tonight, more than welcome to ask any questions about any of it, and we can try to, I'll see if I can guide you, or if other people have any input, they can guide you as well. Um, and kind of the last thing, I, I know I already briefly went through this, and I've said this many a times, two things technically. Uh, first of which, all of the video recordings are on YouTube now. So that playlist, that ME240 SOLIDWORKS playlist, all the video lectures, aside from the one that I screwed up and I didn't uh, actually record, um, all of them are in that playlist. However, the uh, a video that kind of encompasses datum planes and revolve is is currently in that uh, in that announcements right above the uh, the playlist. Um, so, kind of as you guys might expect, I want to make sure that everybody is asking questions. So, if I do pose any sorts of questions that are not rhetorical that I'll just answer like two seconds later. You guys are more than willing to, to speak up if you think you know what I'm getting at or if you have any questions pertaining to any of those things. Um, I mean, you can either ask those questions just by turning your mic off and asking them or you can just post them uh, in chat. So don't at any point feel like you uh, cannot ask any questions. You guys are more than willing to do so and interrupt me please if i am ever either going too fast or there's anything that you're just like i don't know how the heck you just did that there um okay so we don't have too many people in right now so i'm just gonna wait another couple of minutes um i guess in the meantime has anybody been having issues with the homework assignment um, I know it was just a single homework assignment, so hopefully it wasn't too crazy. Uh, we can definitely talk about it tonight if that is uh, desired. Um, and let me see. Yeah, so it looks like we got about close to 20 people who have turned it in so far, so hopefully more people will be able to turn it in as the day goes on, um, or if anybody needs any assistance with that. Um, <clears throat> where the heck is everybody? Oh well. Um, so the PowerPoint is posted on Canvas right now. Uh, so I won't be sharing that, but any sort of demos or anything I can go through or I will be going through on SolidWorks, which I'm streaming right now. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, so the first thing, or at least just general overview of today, we're going to be covering two new features, and we're also going to be covering something that isn't I wouldn't necessarily call it a feature, but it's definitely a helpful thing to know about and to be able to utilize, and that's the spiral and helix feature. Um, so going into that first, the idea behind the spiral or helix feature is quite literally as the name suggests. We either have some kind of a uh, 
spiral pattern that has a base of a circle, or we might have a helix. So kind of if we're thinking of like bio or something like that, um, like a double helix, how DNA is, all we're really doing here is we're pretty much just taking some sort of base circular sketch and I wouldn't even really call it extruding, but just giving it a direction to it with regard to a, uh, a helix pattern. Um, so the general idea when we're working with a helix or even a spiral is the very first thing that we want to do is we want to denote some sort of circle. Um, both of these geometries, uh, or not even geometries, but sketches, uh, have to do with some sort of circular base to them. Really, the circle for the spiral is going to be kind of where it initiates, um, and the uh, and the what is it? The spiral is just going to be uh, kind of designating how wide it goes. Um, and then let's see. So. In order to use a spiral, this is actually just going to reside in our, let me get that up real quick. This is going to be in the curves section. So the first thing that I would want to do is I'm just going to designate some kind of a circle here. And let's just say that this maybe has a diameter of, let's just say 30 in this case, 30 millimeters, hopefully. Yep, cool, 30 millimeters make sure that we're in millimeters right now. And then in terms of creating either a spiral or a helix, we are going to be in our features tab. It'll be at the very far end in the curves dropdown. So we'll hit curves and it'll be at the bottom of that list. So when we hit curves, we, it wants you to select that specific circle that this is being based upon. So if we hit that, we can already see some stuff start happening. So the first of which is that Let's actually just look up here, kind of on the side, where it gives us all the details. So first of all, it's saying defined by. So when it's talking about defined by, there's four different options. Three of these options are related to uh, the spiral pattern itself. So first of which is pitch and revolutions, height and revolutions, or height and pitch. And the third of which is literally just the base spiral. So that one is just going to be the spiral pattern that initiates from whatever the size circle that we generally have, and then it's going to broaden out from there. But let's kind of go down the list. So first and foremost, anybody have any idea what it means by pitch? And if you know, totally fine. You can shout it out if you have any ideas what I mean by pitch. Uh, Is it the slope? Kind of, sort of. So, so in this case, the, the pitch is really just going to be the distance between from peak to peak. So I guess if you kind of think about it in terms of like our, our trig, um, if you have some sort of like sinusoidal function, it's going to pretty much be from like one peak to another. And it's pretty much the same thing in a case like this. The pitch here is effectively just going to be from one end of it to pretty much the exact same point right uh, I guess aligned after it's kind of gone through however many revolutions. Uh, but that, that was a good guess there. So, um, and we're, we're really basing a lot of this off of, or come, some of our options are basing it upon the pitch. So we can say, well, maybe I want it to be even further spread out so we can see the more I bump up the pitch, it's still going to be just a single revolution. It ends at the very same point. However, the pitch is going to kind of increase, kind of stretch it out. So the pitch is related to the height of it. Uh, perhaps I might want to really ignore the pitch and I just want it to go some amount of revolutions around while maintaining a certain height. Perhaps we want this, uh, this spiral, this helix sketch to be a specific height. Um, with a specific number of revolutions, and I might not know what the pitch is right off the bat. So it's a good way of being able to just say, here's the two designations that I want. Uh, and I can also increase the number of resolution, or revolutions. I believe this goes, yes, on a quarter revolution basis. So the up arrow is just going to increase it by a quarter revolution at a time, but I can put in other numbers here as well, or not full revolutions. If I wanted to, I could say, well, maybe I want like 
10 and 1 tenth of a revolution, 0.1, and then it'll automatically accommodate for that. Um, with regard to the start angle, that's really just saying where on the circle itself it's going to start. Generally, I don't play with this too much. Um, it's probably nice to kind of have an idea as to where the start angle is going to be. Sometimes it will be necessary. So if I choose 360 or basically zero, it's pretty much telling me that the uh, origin of this circle or where it kind of begins is going to be right here, almost at this bottom right hand corner. Um, and we kind of talked about this a little bit, but with regard to the taper uh, or the idea of tapering or drafting things. It's kind of a little bit of a giveaway, but what do you think might happen if we try to taper this helix? If anybody has any ideas what that might do? What does taper mean? Won't that tighten it up at the top so it'll be fat at the bottom and then get tighter at the top? Exactly. It's going to give it more of a conical shape. Uh, and we can even see right here this little uh, checkbox. I think I already selected that before. Maybe it's default, but that's essentially just going to broaden it instead of kind of making it more of a conical shape or tightening it. So if I hit, hit this and I start increasing the degrees, it's going to expand that outward, kind of be more of a cone shaped outward. And if I hit inward, well, it kind of turns into almost like a little Christmas tree type thing, just about. Uh, it also takes into account that the degree can only be so great. So, I mean, if I try to increase this value, it's going to say, hey, I can't really do that because you're saying that it has to have some designated height. And it does end up changing this taper as well. So this taper angle is going to be a function of whatever the height is. So a greater height is going to result in a smaller angle. And it does that automatically. So upon hitting this, it creates that kind of spiral shape. And I might actually just want something that looks a little bit more basic than this. So I'm going to turn the taper off. And when I hit OK, you get almost kind of like a, like a screw type uh, threading pattern going on. Um, so then the next thing that we can kind of discuss here as well is let me actually just copy this exact same uh, sketch and then just paste it onto the top plane again. So all I did there was I just clicked on the sketch, I hit Control C to copy that one, and then usually if you're copying a sketch, it doesn't necessarily know where you want to place it, since there's three primary planes. So if I click on one of those planes, it'll copy it directly to that specific primary datum plane. So it's actually a really nice way of being able to kind of select something uh, that you want to copy and designate where it's supposed to go if you don't want to just entirely recreate the sketch that's given. Little point that uh, can make things fairly nice if, if we kind of have that information. Uh, and also something that I haven't really gone over too much, but the suppress feature. So suppress really just means that it's going to take any sort of features or sketches, I believe, and it's kind of just going to silence them. It's going to make sure that it's not something that we're looking at. I know sometimes we might try to use like the hide, but suppress is just going to effectively get rid of it. It kind of says it's still a piece of what's going on, um, but we're just going to deactivate it for the time being. So right now, even if I hide this, we don't see anything there um, because this entire thing has been suppressed, the base sketch included. So if I show this one more time, show that sketch that I originally started with, I'm going to get just that base sketch, that same thing that I had before. Uh, but let's play around with the other function that it has as well, and this is going to be the spiral. So for a spiral, it's just going to kind of look like a, like almost like a sinkhole, where it's all, or like a tornado, where it's all kind of originating from the center. And there's a whole bunch of information here. So pitch is still going to serve the same function. This is how far apart each of those kind of rings are from one another. We can change the direction. So it's just going to change it from clockwise to, oh, not even clockwise, my mistake. It's actually going to put it on the inside of that circle. This down here will kind of determine whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. So this one's a little bit funkier, but you can change it in either way. You could say, well, maybe I want 
the circle that I start with to be the largest circle that it is. And then uh, I can just have the spiral going inward as opposed to outward. Uh, but having it outward isn't bad either. Um, we can still designate the number of revolutions, so say what well, maybe 20 there, and it'll still do the appropriate number. So the interesting thing about this is that it's, at least as opposed to the helix, it's not just going to continue to build upon whatever is already there. Um, it's, for, for a spiral in this case, just going to add more revolutions to the edge of it. It already knows how far apart they need to be, in this case 1.4, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I can change that value if I need to, if I wanted to spread it out further. Now, granted, this is already pretty wide as it is, so you might not want something that's la that large or that many revolutions, rotations, uh, but it could be useful depending upon what information you might be given for a specific kind of a drawing. Um, let's see, is there anything that I missed with regard to the spiral? So I know I talk a little bit about it in the, uh, in the PowerPoint. So really the only difference being here is that a helix is going to essentially move out of plane, so perpendicular to that base sketch, uh, whereas the spiral is going to stay within that sketch. Uh, also a point of clarification, the revolutions, as I showed before, it does not need to be a whole number. So not only can it be some sort of uh, quarter or a half, but it could be a tenth or any other sort of uh, decimal value as well. Um, so we might be asking ourselves, well, why do we care about uh, a spiral in this case? Um, and that leads us into one of the one of the first kind of main features that we're actually going to talk about today, which is the sweep feature. So sweep is actually pretty interesting. It allows us to make sort of more advanced or more complex extrusions whenever it might be necessary. So the two main points that we want to think about whenever we're dealing with sweep is that we're going to not only need at least bare minimum, we're going to want a closed sketch and that's going to essentially be the profile of our sweep. That's pretty much what the general shape uh, of our um, geometry that we might make will be. And then we typically also have an open sketch curve. Uh, so what we can do is, well, we have one of those two things. We have an open sketch curve right here. It's a spiral that we actually have. Uh, and then from there, if we want to, if we want to create some sort of a geometry out of this rather than it just being a sketch or just in this case a single curve we can do that as well so if we we're going back to SolidWorks and let's just say let's make this a little bit simpler so nicer numbers typically are a bit more pleasant to work with so I'm going to say that it has a pitch of 10 and maybe let's say that it has about five revolutions here so if I zoom in a bit more and that's actually pretty nice. I didn't even notice that before, but it tells us the diameter at this point from where we started with. So we had a 30 millimeter uh, original circle that we began on, and then it eventually became uh, 100 millimeters greater than that because there's five of those out here. I believe they're like double. Yeah, it's, it's double counting. This is diameter. So to have half of that as a radius. So we'll create this. And now we have a pretty cool spiral pattern. And before we even try to create a closed profile to kind of base this upon, let's actually look at what the menu has. So I already have this spiral selected. I'm going to hit the sweep boss base button. So this is pretty much directly next to a lot of our other extrusion options. So just to the right of our extrude and revolve boss, we have our sweep boss. So the first thing that we see here is that it's already taking into account that we have a clo or a, a, an open curve. Um, so it's designated kind of by showing the path. And then the other thing is going to be the profile. So that profile can be basically anything. The one thing that we do need to be a little bit careful about is that for a path like this, we want to make sure that there's really no intersection between this whatever sort of profile we give on this curve and whatever sort of profile ends up being on the next closest curve. Uh, 
uh, sometimes or oftentimes Solid, SolidWorks doesn't like intersecting geometries, as I'm sure you guys are probably aware of now. Um, but before we even do that, let's actually look at some of the other options that we have, specifically a circular profile. So the nice thing is that perhaps we don't even want some sort of crazy profile. Perhaps we just want something that's uh, going to be from uh, just starting off or, or just a circular path in general. So this is actually being a little bit more finicky than I would like it to be. Uh, sometimes it's trying to designate it between the two, but what's nice is that we can actually create just a circular path that will create that profile automatically. For spiral, it's a little bit, as I said, it's a little bit finicky, so because if I try to hit enter, it's just going to create this weird, like, paper thin sheet. So let's actually just create a closed profile. So this actually might be just a little bit tricky. And the reason for that is because sometimes for something like this, now we want to create a profile that's going to start or even pierce one of these ends of it. So sometimes that can be a little bit tricky because we might actually have to create datum planes depending on what we might have or depending on what kind of profile we might be looking for. But the nice thing is that we already have some base profiles already or some base datum planes, excuse me. So I'm actually gonna use the right plane as we can kind of see it is already going through and it does go through these specific end points. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just gonna sketch on this plane. And I'm going to, first things first, I'm going to make sure that I'm looking directly at it. It's kind of hard to see because from this angle, it literally just looks like a straight line. But I know that furthest region is going to be right where that end point will be. So unfortunately, you usually when you're trying to create another sketch here, it's already, you might already be able to tell, it's not giving me the option to kind of link it up right with that end point, not even if I tilt it a little bit to be a little bit more specific. So I'm actually just going to maybe approximate it. Heck, I might even just throw it a little bit off center. And that's totally okay. And the reason for that, once I smart to mention this, and I'll just say that this is like seven and a half. Okay. The reason for that is because I can apply some relations. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to say, hey, I want this point right here on the center to pierce, and it might do it, might not. I guess it won't do it right here. Let me see if I can smart dimension it like that. Oh, come on. I should be able to line up these two things here. Maybe it's being a little finicky. Sometimes I like to start from the center a bit more often uh, and then just move outward. So I'm actually going to do that instead. So I'm still going to work on the right plane here and I'm going to see if I can perhaps create something that's like that. It's not as important for it to be uh, piercing this plane, um, but it is nice to have. So there, now I, I got it to work. So I was just able to click the center and this edge here, or just this spiral edge. And when I hit pierce, it actually aligns things pretty nicely. So now it knows that this center is going to be coincident or piercing right through, uh, rather the, the spiral shape is piercing right through the center of this circle. So that's about all that I wanted out of that. Now if I go back to sweep, now it's actually designated that sketch. When I hit this helix here, it's going to pretty much create like a hose shape that we have right here. So if I hit OK, now I have this geometry here. So this can be useful sometimes, but this is probably primarily going to be something that you would do more often with like the sweep cut. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so some other features of the uh, 
of the sweep as well are, if I just go back into this menu, is going to be guide curves. So guide curves are a little bit interesting to work with. Uh, basically, the idea behind guide curves here is that we want to, we're essentially designating a path for our, for the outside of our sketch. So it's actually a little bit more complex than uh, just working with a, just working with a single curve and then a single profile. Um, I mean, heck, if I wanted to, I could change this circular profile as well to something that's even just a little bit more more complex, perhaps. And if I wanted to, I could say, well, maybe I'm going to do something like that, where I might want to trim away some certain things here. So well, I got that, I got that, and that. Let's try to make something that looks like this. Why the heck not? And then if I hit exit, so now it still creates that same profile as it goes across. So we do want to be typically a little bit careful when we're editing sketches of things that uh, deal with sweep or loft, but sometimes we can kind of uh, play around with that a little bit and it might actually work out. Usually suppressing things or suppressing features more specifically is a good thing to do when you start messing around with the sketches because it might not rebuild entirely uh, nicely as it should. So let's actually play a little bit more with guide curves now. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to suppress some of the stuff. So it suppress that sweep as well. And let's say I want to maybe create something that looks like a vase. Something like that, I guess. So we'll have our base. And I'll smart dimension this. Just make sure we have some sort of measurement to it. I'm just going to say that that's 50. And the other factors that we want, so if we're going to use guide curves, well then we're actually going to need two more open profiles to do our sweep as opposed to just one. The reason for this is because one of those profiles, or rather one of those is going to be the path and the other will be the guide curve. So the path is essentially indicating the height of this or even just the general profile or the general kind of direction that it's going. It could go kind of in a zigzag manner. And then the guide curve is actually going to give us information about the outside of what this shape looks like. So that's kind of an important factor to have. And in fact, what I'm actually going to do, I'm not going to do a circle. I'm actually going to do a square in this case. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to get rid of the circle that we have. I know, there we go. So I'm going to say that this should be square, so all of those sides are equal to each other. I'm going to say that this is still 50, and I'm going to make sure that it is coincident with the origin. So it's fully defined, everything is all nice and dandy. <clears throat> and then I want to create a couple more sketches. So I created one sketch on that top plane, but now I want to create some that go in a direction that is perpendicular to that. So I could either do the front or the right, but I have the right selected right here, so I can just do that. I typically like to break these up, and what I mean by that is I'll typically like to say that one of my sketches is just going to indicate the height or how high up this is going to go. So I'm just going to say 100 millimeters. And then I'm going to exit out of that and I'm going to create another sketch pattern that is also on that same, uh, that same plane, only it's a different sketch. So it might be a little bit finicky here as well. We might still have to make sure that it pierces through this base profile. As you can see right now, SolidWorks is usually pretty good at making sure that things that are supposed to be coincident are actually there. It doesn't do a very good job when we're trying to do things that are on two separate sketches. So I'm going to make this look kind of funky. I'm going to scroll up a little bit. And then I might do something like this, maybe make a little bit of a curve. Oop, something kind of more like that. Then maybe it lines up. Something like that. Oh, that's actually not lining up right there. So I'll make sure that those 
or merged. And the other thing that I'm actually going to do is, so first of which, I do want to smart to mention this at least a little bit, but I also want to make sure that these are of the same height. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign a relationship of horizontal. This already has a measurement of 100, which means it's just going to pull this entire thing upward, uh, however necessary. Cool. So that's the first thing. And then we can already see that it kind of just moved everything upward. So I'm going to want to say that these two things should be coincident to each other. So kind of the coincidence of two sketches that are either or rather just not even on the same plane is going to be your Pierce relationship. You're going to want to use this a whole lot whenever you're dealing with the sweep function. So when I hit Pierce, it's just going to automatically stick the end point of that curve right on the edge of that square there. Now let's try to, in fact, I'm gonna be a little bit lazy. I'm just going to assign some dimensions to this. So kind of looks a little funky, but that's totally okay. I don't really want it to be super nice looking in terms of how this uh, guide pattern is actually going to be. So I'm going to exit out of my sketch. And now I have three sketches. So that's the thing, that's one of the things that I really want to stress right here if we're working with guide curves. First of which is that we have our base profile, which is going to be this square shape. We have the height or the path. And then we also have a guide curve, which is essentially dictating the end behavior of this curve. And actually what I'm going to do, I'm gonna make this a little bit more kind of flat. So I'm going to choose this to be like 20. Uh, that's not what I wanted, but here's what I can possibly do. Maybe if it is a bit smaller. I don't necessarily want that either. So I'm just gonna cut part of it off. I want this to look just a bit nicer. Oh, come on. Maybe that'll work? Yes, it will. Cool. And then I'll say that this point here should be horizontal with this guy. So we'll pull it up, and there we go. So that's much more looking a whole lot better as, as opposed to what it was before. Uh, just to prevent any sort of possible intersecting geometry. We don't really want that. So if we go back and we hit our sweet boss base, well, first thing that we can do here is we're just going to designate the path. So I'm going to hit this bottom profile here, and then the path, which it's really no different than a basic extrusion that we've seen before. I mean, if we're, if we're trying to use a sweet boss for something that looks like this, you're trying to reinvent the wheel. Uh, but instead, we're trying to have this outside face, or rather all of these faces, uh, follow a certain path. So once I hit this, uh-oh, I think it doesn't like it. Ah, that's right, that's right, that's right. I forgot my own notes. So the one thing that we actually do want to do is we want to make sure that our base profile is underdefined. This is kind of stupid. I'm not a big fan of it after I've been harping on it being uh, very important to define all of your sketches. But essentially, the reason Guide Curves doesn't like the base to be uh, defined is because we're trying to create something that actually has a larger uh, side length to it. I mean, as this Guide Curve is showing, this is increasing or it's going to increase the general size of that square. So I mean, if I took a cross section right across here, the square that it makes from that cross section is actually going to be different in size than the square that you'd make at the very base. So you actually want that bottom face or that profile when you're working with guide curves most of the time to be underdefined. It sucks, I know, because I've been harping on it so much and you guys are probably like, what the heck is wrong with you? Uh, but it's just a fact of how this this specific feature works. Um, so there's another option here that we can kind of take a look at, and that's the merge smooth faces. So what that's actually doing is if I kind of take a look at it from this angle, 
we can see that this is a nice smooth curve as opposed to the sharp edge that was actually here as we had defined it. So one way that if we actually want that to be as, as rigid as it is implied with the guide curve, just hitting or unchecking that merge smooth faces. Now we can see our sketch is actually, or rather our, our pattern is much more rigid as the guide curve implied. So now we have something where we actually have individual faces, things that are far more just flat faces with no kind of fillets adding to them, as opposed to having it selected. Should be fine. Famous last words. Now, where it's actually just one nice smooth face, where it's already incorporating in all those kind of little curves and fillets that it would naturally make. So this is a nice way to kind of create other geometries that might be trickier. I mean, heck, if I wanted to kind of really fulfill what this is supposed to be, I could say, hey, I'll just do a shell. Oh, come on. Say so that's five. Not 52, 5. What is your problem? Yeah, you're fine. Then it'll create the sort of uh, vase shape to it. Okay, cool. So that covers a couple different things right there. Uh, if we kind of take a look at the PowerPoint one more time. We talked a little bit about the sweet boss. We went over guide curves, kind of creating those sorts of shapes here. So yes, the merge smooth faces will either make sure that we have a uh, smooth kind of curved shape over any sort of edges that we won't need to assign as we're making those curves or as we're making that, that guide curve that's already there. Um, or if we turn it off, it'll make sure that the, all of those are these uh, rigid edges where it actually has an edge to it as opposed to a nice curve. So as I wonderfully stated and then I forgot in my PowerPoint on where it talks about guide curves, we don't want to fully define that base. Reason being, it's trying to take that base and change that geometry as it goes across the path. If we assign dimensions to it, it fails. It's not able to say, I can't put a 30 by 30 square here um, if I'm trying to make a, uh, a curve, or rather a section, if you will, that might be 45 think. by 45. What's up? Um, the base you underdefined it, um, how did you do it again? How did you remove the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Underdefining it. So yeah. if you want to do that, let me suppress this, and that's a great question. Um, I would just go back to the base sketch um, if you haven't already done the sweep. So just know which one is the base sketch. And usually, oftentimes, I'm going to assign a dimension, but then delete it just so you know. So this already knows that it's supposed to be 50. It can be a little bit of a pain sometimes because when you click on it, it's like, oh, you want to change the value, right? And it's like, no, I relax i just want to get rid of that actually if you click on one of the lines kind of like the leaders for it then it won't actually immediately grab the 50 and then i can just hit the delete button and it'll get rid of it automatically um good question because there's been god knows how many times where i'll try to be deleting a dimension because of situations like this or perhaps i grab the wrong the wrong dimension on say uh uh, when I'm creating the drawings, and it'll keep saying, oh, you want to dimension this? It's like, no, I want to do the opposite. I want to get rid of this, actually. Uh, so if you just kind of hit like the side of one of those uh, leaders, it'll automatically get rid of it once you hit delete, thankfully. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, let's see. So we went over guide curves a little bit. And then next up is kind of like we've had all of these different options here, we can do a cut with our sweep as well. So I know I kind of use the hose example where we were using the spiral, but I think this will kind of be a little bit nicer uh, if we try to maybe create some sort of inside shape or pattern on the inside of this. And it's going to function in a very similar manner as, as you might expect. 
so what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to keep that shell suppressed because I don't want it. Um, I want to kind of create uh, my own sweep uh, via a cut instead. So I'm actually just going to cut on this very top face or try to sketch something on this very top face. And it's going to look super weird, but uh, that's totally okay. That's the point. So I'll create a circle. I don't want it to be too large because I don't necessarily want it kind of cutting outside of the geometry just for the sake of making this look, I guess, remotely nice. But I'll just create some sort of circular geometry here. I'll say that it has a diameter of 25 in this case. And then I'm going to hit OK. So right off the bat, this is going to be our uh, this will be our profile. And then if I want to create the pattern, I want to make sure that, or rather the path, I want to make sure that that path is still going on the inside of this here. So normally we might want to create some sort of a datum plane if our uh, if our geometry is already slightly off-centered, but we don't really need to do that. We can actually just use the right plane and sketch from there. So it already knows I want to sketch on this plane. Uh, and I'm going to make this one a little bit kind of crazy. Why the heck not? So I'll see if I can start right there and then kind of... Uh, I see. So it's not doing what I want because it still thought I was in that one. So I'm going to go to the right plane to sketch now. And then I can line it up reasonably nicely. I'll say that it's about right there. I'll go down a little bit, and then I might start making some funky patterns, just to illustrate a point here. And then I'll do something that kind of looks like that. And then maybe... Oop. Let's actually have it start going down now. Maybe something like that. And then just a bit further, just so it kind of reaches further down inside of it. Uh, and I want this to be a bit of a nicer path. It'll just make sure that uh, the geometry lines up at least moderately nicer. Uh, this one can kind of stay as it is, but I'll try to make sure that this one is tangent here as well. So it's a really weird pattern. Super crazy, but that's totally okay. So I'm just going to say that this is like 15, so it makes it a little bit bigger. Uh, and I'm not really just going to sm uh, bother smart uh, dimensioning everything there, uh, because we don't really necessarily have to. Uh, so when I exit the sketch, instead this time I'm going to hit the Sweep Cut option, which is right next to our Revolve Cut, kind of where all the rest of our cutting options are. And it already knows I want it to be across that profile. If I choose this one here, should work. Oh, come on. Can I get a point? Ah, I see what I did. So the reason it's doing that is because these right here are not intersecting, like I said you should do. So before we continue, let's make sure that it is piercing the center of that sketch, or at the very least, I think if they are coincident to each other, maybe. Um, actually, I think if I do it from the base sketch, it should pull the path to it. Eh, or not. Maybe if I just make it coincident. Uh, as soon as I can see, there we go. So if I hit those two, if I make them coincident to each other, that should work. I don't think it's going to behave too crazily. I guess we'll see. So if I do a sweep cut now, choose not that. That's wrong on both accounts. Oh, come on. Behave. <laughs> you and this path. Maybe it'll work? Sweep operation failed to complete. Might be because of this very harsh edge there. We'll see if I can fix that real quick. Uh, occasionally it doesn't like hard edges like that. So we might want to be a little bit more careful. Maybe I'm being a little bit too 
uh, crazy with how I'm trying to assign some of these dimensions. So I'll say that that's tangent, and that's tangent. Okay, there should be no reason that you're yelling anymore. And just for the sake of things, maybe I'll say that this actually goes all the way down to that portion of it. And why the heck not? I'll fully define it. Okay. Now are you going to work? And just for the sake of ease, I might actually reduce the diameter of this a bit more, just so it'll be a nicer sketch pattern. I'm going to make this about 10. Okay. So now it has a profile that it should be able to go across. My concern is that it might intersect right at this pretty tight curve, but I guess we'll see. Shouldn't matter, but... Okay, there we go. So the cool thing about when you're using the cut is that it'll actually show you exactly what that profile will look like at those specific curve-to-curve uh, -curve intersections. So we can see that it's kind of a nice profile. It's a vertical profile at the end where it starts that line and then at the very beginning. If I hit OK on this, well, we can't really see much of anything. But if we do a cross-section, in the correct direction, we can see exactly that path that we had followed. So looks a little bit funky. I would hesitate to say that you should have a phase that looks like this, but could be kind of cool. Um, and you can use guide curves with the sweep cut as well. So if I suppress that and I pretty much do just about the same thing, kind of make some kind of a uh, inside patch, uh, pattern that I would want to have a uh, more unique outer profile to it. So if I just smart dimension this guy, let's just say that this is 20, make sure that they are reasonably small so nothing on the inside of this is going to uh, complain. And then in this case, again, we can choose the right plane and specifically sketch on that one. And then this time, we're just going to choose a nice uh, straight pattern. So nothing crazy about this. But the outside of it will be a little bit uh, more unique, if you will. And we do want this to essentially line up. It'd be a whole lot easier if I just look completely normal to it. Let's do something that kind of looks like that. And why the heck not? Let's make this go down at least a little bit further. Something that kind of looks like that. Actually, I want to make sure that this also, the main path, goes down that far as well. So, uh, oh crap. <laughs> How far down was this? I believe I can just do that, and that should suffice. There we go. How about if I do something like this, if I get that and that, and then say that they're horizontal one to one another. There we go. So now those paths are aligned. They don't always have to be in terms of the guide curve as well as the path have to be the same uh, length as each other, but it does help. Uh, it does make sure that that's not going to be a cause of concern. And just so we are safe, I'm going to make sure that this is piercing, so, okay, I don't need two of them. There we go, so it is piercing that specific profile, and kind of same idea. If I do a sweep cut, I'll designate this as the profile. That's the path, so now we just get a basic extrude cut, but when I choose this, it's probably going to yell at me, and the reason for that is because I define this again because I keep doing that because it's such a such a habit. But now it should work. And 
And this is why I said there wasn't going to be much of an in-class assignment for this one, because some little factors here and there, more specifically with guide curves, are a pain in the butt. But we do get a profile that looks like whatever the heck that squiggly pattern is. And if we do a cross-section, we can see exactly that. And it's pretty much the exact same thing on all sides. So the nice thing about it is that so long as you're not designating more than one guide curve, it will it will apply that single guide curve that you gave to one of those specific sides to all of the sides that are there. Um, so when we have this shape here, we've created kind of this weird geometry, at least with regard to three specific uh, profile, path, and guide curve that we have here. Um, that's about the length that I want to go with regard to uh, with using sweep. Um, OK, there, there's actually one more thing that we'll kind of briefly discuss. Uh, and what we can actually do with the sweep here as well is we can kind of etch certain shapes or other geometries into uh, perhaps maybe some geometry that we already have. So let's just kind of quickly do it at the very top here. I know we have a lot of sketches going on so far, but I'm just going to make a very base sketch. And let's say I want to create maybe some kind of like almost like a divot in the very top face here, as opposed to creating some sort of internal area, I might want to just carve out maybe some kind of pattern that might have some other uh, pattern to it, uh, so, or some other profile to it. So I'm just going to start sketching on this just a little bit. So we'll do something like that. Like that, maybe that. And we'll do just going off to the side. And in addition to this, what I could do is remember, we can create circular profiles just based upon a path. So if I exit out of this, I don't even really need to designate a profile for it. I could if I'd want to, but I don't necessarily need to. So if I hit sweep cut, and I designate this profile here, if I hit circular, then it's already giving me some sort of dimension here. I would recommend changing this dimension appropriately before assigning your curve, um, just because there are times where it might lag out a little bit. So thankfully it wasn't too crazy, but the more complex your pattern is going to be, if you have a larger diameter, or if you have any sort of sides that are intersecting with one another, like these edges here, where it might do stuff like this, tends to make things a little bit more difficult. So let's just actually say I reduce this a little bit more to, let's just say five. And when I hit OK, we'll actually carve out like a channel uh, into the top face of this pattern that we have here. So I didn't even need to, kind of like what we were talking about before, I didn't even need to designate a, uh, a specific profile for this, it just made one based upon a circular path at, after I told it to do so. Uh, and we can figure this out. I mean, if we look down here, it gives me a radius of two and a half, which is, I mean, just as what it should be since we gave it a diameter of five. So we always do want to make sure we're checking that there, but we can pretty much do this sort of thing with pretty much anything. Uh, I mean, if I wanted to even change up this pattern, what I actually have here, I could just change up the base sketch. Um, if I want to maybe connect those two there, and I believe this should work. Uh, even though this is a closed path, there's a, a potential that this will work as well. So if I exit out of this, so it didn't actually create the one going across as well. For whatever reason, um, I think it might just be because it's it doesn't see that as part of the the pattern. I might need to designate that on the open path. So yeah, so it's saying that it's an open loop, but if I click it again to kind of reassign that sketch, it'll say, oh, okay, I get it. You want that entire triangular shape. So hint, hint that this idea is kind of going to be present in the homework assignment that we have. 
Um, alrighty, let's take a look at what else we have. So we kind of went over that where we can kind of carve in like a W as I show in like the PowerPoint. Um, and now let's go through Loft. So Loft has a lot of stuff to it. So I, I would say the majority of the time is going to be spent on this feature here and kind of talking about this feature. So Loft is a way for us to essentially connect two different, or rather they can be different, but two closed shapes or sketches rather. These sketches can be parallel, they can be perpendicular, they could be some other angle, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, so that's actually kind of a nice thing about the loft feature. Um, there's a ton of different ways that we can really utilize the loft. It's just that it can be a little bit tricky with regard to getting it correct since there are factors within the menu that make things not as exact with each other. So just for the sake of ease, let me go back to SolidWorks. And I'm actually just going to open up a new file. Uh, just because we have a bunch of stuff here and I want a clean features tree. So first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to just create some basic geometry. Just going to create a rectangle. I am going to smart dimension at this time and maybe one of these days I'll remember to not smart dimension it when we start talking about guide curves because fortunately, unfortunately, depending on what you think, we can use guide curves as well with the loft feature. So I'm going to create dimensions for this here specifically. And then the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create a datum plane because I want it to be a little bit more complex. I want to make sure that whatever I am lofting this shape to, it's still going to kind of be in like a like a Cartesian to this, but it's not just going to be like directly above or below. I want it to be even a little bit more complex than that. So I'm going to create a datum plane with respect to the right plane. And then I'm actually going to bump it out a little bit more. I'm going to say 100. So right now I have created another plane that is 100 millimeters away from the kind of global origin where this originates, where it starts. Uh, and then I'm now going to sketch on this plane. So I'm going to create just a basic circle. So I'm going to say, okay, well, I'll make it right here. Won't make it too crazy. We'll just make sure that everything aligns a bit properly. I'll make this a bit bigger so it kind of fits properly. And then I'll see if I can smart dimension things. So I'll say that this is like 135. And then I'll say that these are horizontal or vertical to each other, excuse me. So now everything is fully defined, which hopefully that won't be an issue later on. So now I have two different sketches here, clearly of differing uh, geometry entirely. Uh, so, if we go back, and right below our uh, our sweep boss base is going to be loft, so lofted boss base. When we hit that, again, I mean, it almost seems like each, each feature we use has more stuff to it. So this one here has a lot of different stuff going on, first of which is going to be the profiles. Profiles are going to be all the different shapes, sketch shapes, that you will have for uh, that, that this geometry is going to be based upon. We also have guide curves. So once again, we do want to be at least a little bit cautious about when we define or underdefine certain things. We have center line parameters, which I'm sure you probably have some idea of what that means. Essentially what's going on there is we would have some kind of a curve that goes through, pierces the center of all of our shapes, more specifically centroid, because sometimes we might have more complex shapes. Um, and we also have start and end constraints. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, so I'll try to go through it not terribly quickly. First of which is just going to be a free form loft. 
What this means is that we're not assigning any sort of guide curves or center lines or any sort of end constraints. constraints. We're just making sure all of our profiles are lined up in this menu. So when I just click on this profile and then I left click on this circular profile as well, it's essentially going to drag the shape of one to the other and make sure that it accommodates things properly. So it's already looking at this and it's kind of doing things in a slightly funky way. As you can see right here, it's basically saying that this sharp edge down here at the bottom is going to line up and end up becoming part of this curve here right at what I would say to be just about the horizontal. Yeah, so just above the horizontal. We can move these around to make this look a little bit nicer. So if I just hit enter on this, it's going to look pretty funky. Everything is not really nicely aligned as we might want it to be. So if I actually go back into this menu, I'm going to play with these a little bit more. You can actually drag these uh, green dots more often than not, and they'll kind of show you what the geometry looks like um, with our kind of base show preview option. So now this is already looking more so what we might imagine or we might picture this shape to actually look like. If I wanted to, I could also do the exact same thing for the very first shape as well. I could move that to the back, and now it's linking that back corner to that bottom left-hand uh, portion of the circle. So that's why I kind of said that it's almost... I don't want to say unfair, but it's it's super funky because I can't really designate, at least to my knowledge, I can't designate an angle or a degree where this part is supposed to be on that specific shape. It doesn't actually align properly with kind of how it's supposed to be or kind of how you would imagine it to be. I don't really know if there's a way to designate it and to say, hey, I want it to be at like, what the heck is that, like a, like a seven o'clock, I guess you could say, um, or whatever a designated degree is. So that's why I won't really be going too much into these or most of the stuff will be free form and you'll kind of have a very good idea as to what the shape will be if I am talking about loft. The nice thing about this is that it doesn't actually have to be just two profiles. Uh, it has to be at least two profiles. So I can make many, many more if I would like to and change the shape of this radically. I could even, if I want to, make it a vertex as well. So in an event like that, let's actually do something like this. It's going to kind of be cool because if I assign a vertex to a circular base, it's going to create something that's conical. So I am going to create another datum plane and sure why the heck not it'll just be a uh, hundred millimeter height for that cone and i'll basically extend this up a little bit i do want to sketch on it and hardest sketch ever i'm just going to put a single point there right there in the very middle and then select technically is underdefined because it's just a point out in nowhere. Uh, so we could smart dimension that if we want to, but for the intents and purposes right now, I don't really need to. Uh, and then I'll edit feature. And then since it's still in that same menu, and I think I see what it's doing, I'm going to pick it from this drop down. Should allow me, uh, darn. It's because this came after. So what I'm actually going to do is I might try to roll this forward a little or better yet, I'm just going to delete the loft. Uh, so nice thing sometimes, uh, in case some of you haven't really seen this quite yet, um, if you delete features, unless you specify deleting the sketches as well, it'll spit out all the sketches that it's designated. So it's a nice way that you can say, I, I just want to get rid of the feature, I don't want to actually get rid of the sketches themselves, unless you specifically state so. So I'm going to click the first base, the second base, I'm going to adjust this maybe a little bit more to what I want it to look like, about that. And then I'm going to hit this vertex, and now it actually looks even more 
kind of crazy because it's not only just saying that some of these things need to align, but it's using that as both a cross section to kind of curve inward and then give or end right here at this uh, very tip here. Um, so it is a way that you can assign all sorts of different um, profiles to a sketch while still kind of creating more complex geometries. One thing to keep in mind is that this is, generally speaking, a lot harder to dimension in its current state, and all of these faces are, for lack of a better term, super weird. So I wouldn't really recommend when you are, or if you are using something that is lofted, to try to use these as sketch planes. Because, I mean, if I try, it's going to be like, what the heck are you talking about, dude? I can't sketch on that. It's curved. Um, you're losing your mind. So I can't really do anything with a curved path like that. I could on the bottom if I want to, if I want to create like screw holes or any sort of other extrusions or extrude cuts right here on the bottom. I could certainly do that. Um, but that's really the extent of what I would be able to add to something like this on one of the faces that already exists. Um, so does anybody at least so far have any issues or questions with regard to just the freeform loft? Because some of the, the stuff that we're going to get into is, is building on this idea of how loft works, um, and it will get a little bit more complex as we go. So any questions so far? Okay. And I mean, you guys already know by now, but y'all can just shout stuff out if, if you really need to. Uh, let's see. Okay. So as you might expect, pretty similar to just like how we had it in the sweep, we can also assign guide curves to this as well. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually just going to delete this. I'm going to delete this loft. We already kind of know what it looks like. Um, and what I'm going to do, just for fear of it yelling at me, because you all know by now SolidWorks is known to do that, I'm going to get rid of the dimensions for that base that's there. It shouldn't yell about this one here, but if need be, I can get rid of that uh, dimension for that as well, but I, I guess we'll see. And rather than having a point in space here, let's make it kind of like a square, something where it's just smaller face at the very end. So it's going from a square or rather a rectangular profile to a circular profile to a square profile. And the only thing that I'm going to do here, hopefully this doesn't yell at me, just make it equal. Um, so right now, it, it should be pretty good in terms of what it wants. Um, I guess proof of concept, I can just leave this here, and, and hopefully it won't uh, moan about it. Uh, and then the next thing that I'm going to do, actually, is I'm going to create a guide curve. So same as before, I want to make sure that I have some curve that is tracing the edge of each of these shapes. So it's going to pierce this edge, it'll pierce this bottom edge, and it'll pierce the bottom edge of this square here as well. I basically want something that's going to kind of curve like that. And it could be a little bit crazier, but I don't want to make this too insane. Um, just because the more complex you're making your loft, the harder it's going to be for it to actually take. Uh, and we already kind of saw that in some cases. It's just like there's you're asking me to do something that's impossible right now. Uh, loft tends to do that, so we want to be kind of more precise whenever we're working with that. And thankfully, the front plane goes through all of these guys. So let's start making a sketch. I'm just going to go normal to this, so it's at least a little bit easier to kind of take a look at. So I'm going to start right here, and actually before I do that, I'm just going to hide both of these planes, so it'll be a little bit easier to see kind of where the bottom of these things are supposed to be. Uh, I don't want to make this too insane, because God only knows SolidWorks will not be happy about it. 
and I'll do that. So that's cool. It's already not aligning, but that's totally okay. We can just merge these. So we'll merge those guys. It looks like it's already taking into account that that should be uh, coincident with the uh, circle that's there. And then if I'm not entirely crazy, these should be tangent. Maybe they are, yes they are. And then maybe I'll get just a little bit crazy with kind of how I do this last one here. I'll maybe try to go inward a bit, outward, and then just something like that. Something to give it a little bit more pizzazz to it. Why not? And hopefully this should work here. I might actually just drag this point just a little bit down just so we kind of have a nice curvature to it. I want to make sure that everything here is going to be coincident or piercing. So I'll pierce that guy. I'll select that edge and I'll select that end point and I'll hit pierce there as well. And then last but not least, I'll select this edge and I'll select that point and I will hit pierce as well. It's already saying that it's coincident and usually that's good enough. Having it pierce is a way so that it's not going to over define things and it's still going to ensure that it understands the kind of pathway that you're asking for. Um, my fear, is that since this circle is defined, it's going to uh, moan quite a bit about how this right here is trying to change the diameter of that. So I guess for safety's sake, I'm going to underdefine that and I'm going to take away this specific measurement. Um, it shouldn't have any issue with this height right here, just because that's designating where in space this circle is located, not specifically uh, what the diameter of that circle is, but I guess we'll see. Um, hey, Ethan. What's up? Can I ask you a question really quick? Yeah, sure. Um, so for the under de definition of these items, mm -hmm. let's say like um, like you've done, you've you set out to define them just to get them the right size. Yes. So you would just go through smart dimension everything and then just remove all the dimensions and they should remain the same size and then it'll be able to fluctuate with yeah, those. Effectively, that, you can do that. Okay. Another way that you can do it is if you click on your shape and it's easier for things that are more uniform. You'll see on, uh -huh. the, on the left hand side, I know a lot of you have kind of used this parameter stuff as well, where mm. this is a nice way to literally indicate everything both in terms of of where it is in space as well as its diameter or dimensions. It's obviously a little bit more complex if you're thinking about like quadrilaterals or any sort of four-sided or five-sided shape beyond that. Um, yeah. But that's a good way to kind of assign a dimension without specifically smart dimensioning it. You can still do it. I mean, kind of force of habit for me personally is to smart dimension things. And then for an instance like this, where we are using guide curves and you don't really want things to be fully defined, you can just go mm -hmm. back and delete them after you've created those dimensions. Okay, so um, if you don't want to smart or smart dimension anything, mm -hmm. you can just define it on the side. On, and on that, the left hand side, um, yeah. So under the parameters, if you were to change the sh the size manually after that, it would change that. It wouldn't lock it in like smart dimensioning does. Oh, uh, what do you mean? Like if you were to like drag out one of the sides or the corners of the oh, row, I see. Whatever, would it change the parameter? Uh, I don't necessarily think so. I, I mean, if I, okay. yeah, like I can do that. Yeah, can do that. That's actually yeah. a thing that I haven't really talked about too much. But since this isn't defined both in terms of its relation to the uh, the origin or given a specific height, or I guess length and width, I can basically grab something and then just pull on it and play around with it. And what's nice about that is that since I already have things designated to pierce, it'll just automatically yeah. assign things as, as it should be. Oh, that's um, cool. So it, it is a nice little way that um, you can kind of play with your shape a little bit more, um, provided things are underdefined enough, but not like entirely just throwing caution to the wind. Um, I, I generally like to have my my centroid of a shape uh, in a uh, intelligent location. Um, so I would I would typically like to put the centroid of each shape either in line with the origin or on the origin, just because it's a great reference point to have, and it generally speaking automatically uh, 
provides a lot of the relations and smart dimensions necessary uh, while doing like half the work. Um, so it's a good way to kind of not screw things up to the point of where it's just like, oh, here's a bunch of errors that are being thrown. Um, so let's see if we can get a guide curve for this guy to work. Um, so we'll do the loft base one more time. Uh, it already knows I want this specific uh, sketch. I'll add this one to it, and I'll add that one to it. And we can already see it is kind of following something that's vaguely similar to what our guide curve is going to be, but we want to make it at least a little bit more complicated. So if I hit this, now we can see that it's actually doing exactly what we want, funny enough. Um, and Similar to before, where we had it with regard to sweep, we still have these blue, uh, or I know they were green before, but in this case, like a green or a teal uh, circles or kind of nodes that we can play around a little bit more with. So generally speaking, I would leave them as is, unless you're looking at the sketch or like drawing, and then you're looking at what it's telling you is it's going to provide and be like, that does not look the same. I might need to move this up or shift that up a little bit. And then it kind of creates those dimensions uh, as they should. So this is just adjusting things um, appropriately at certain vertices. So it's a lot more of a pain when you're dealing with circular shapes because it's just going to, you have really no good frame of reference to do it. Like, I mean, if I pull it down here, it's just automatically going to make this not as symmetric as we would like it. But generally speaking, you can kind of get things to be the, like the basic shape that you would like it to be. Um, and I think it kind of depends. If I hit OK on this and then I go back to the features, occasionally it will give me some options with regard to uh, other... Um, what is it, uh, with regard to like other um, nodes that I can sort of play around with. So I mean, now we have this, I mean, we had our guide curve here, kind of creating that general profile. And when we hit OK, we get something that looks like whatever the heck that is. Um, obviously just proof of concept kind of thing there. Um, Let's see, so that's a general overview of the guide curves. We can also, as I kind of mentioned before, we can also play around with uh, center lines as well. So as you might kind of imagine, the center lines are going to be more geared towards uh, having a, just a guide curve that the like basic center of the uh, geometry must follow. So honestly, I kind of want to do this. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to unsuppress this. Let me see if I can kind of do things in a slightly intelligent manner. I'm just going to try to copy a lot of these because I want the same bases to be there or those same cross sections but I want to instead now provide a guide curve and then we can kind of compare and contrast the two. So if I suppress that one more time, now I'm just going to, once again, start a sketch on the, I'm assuming front plane. Yes, the front plane here. Um, and I basically, I, I know in the PowerPoint, I make a, at least a slightly more complex datum plane. It's not entirely necessary uh, unless it calls for it, where it's kind of moving maybe off center or something of the sort. Uh, but this should do just as a good proof of concept. So I'm still just going to use the front plane as our sketch plane. Uh, but I'll make sure that this kind of has a very strange look to it, kind of a strange profile to it that it should follow. Um, as we really want it to. Uh, that's definitely going to be a problem uh, if I make that too sharp there. So I'm actually going to do an arc. Let's see, I can do something that kind of looks like that, and like that, and it might smooth it out, maybe, possibly, I hope. I'm going to stop it right there. Thankfully, it is 
receiving those and it's saying, hey, I get it, you want to go right through the center of those guys. Uh, and then I can kind of play with this just a little bit more. Hopefully make it so that it won't be too angry at me when we're playing around with this. I might make that just a curve here instead. Oop. I like arcs a whole lot, if you guys could not tell by this point. And that is probably a cause for concern as well right here. So I'll just trim away one of these lines so we have just a nice, relatively speaking, smooth line. So tangent. And then that should honestly be good enough for the time being. Um, so let's see if it, if it center lines this properly. Uh, so I'll exit that sketch. I could smart dimension this, but just for the sake of, of proof of concept, I'm not going to right off the bat. We don't actually want this to be our guide curve. So instead, now we're going to go into the center line parameter option. Uh, so that following drop down, and we'll click that center line that's there. Now we'll go back up to profiles. This will be a good way that we can kind of tell if it's actually working properly or not. So I'll grab that first base, then I'll grab the second one, and based upon the fact that it's not actually showing a preview, it's probably taking some issue. So first things first, I'm just going to play around with this because occasionally it might not like what's going on here. And I think it has something to do with the thickness of this rectangle here. So I'm actually going to close out of that first, and I'm going to make this a bit smaller. Why are you doing that? There should be no reason you do that. Uh, okay. Why are you not <laughs> lined up with the origin intersection? There we go. That's a bit better. So I'm just going to shrink this down a little bit more so it has kind of a way to maybe round that sharp corner that's there. Um, and even better, I might see if I can make these two lines. Or rather, this line perpendicular. So I'll say you, I'll say you, and then I'll designate perpendicular. So. Now it's actually a slightly smoother curve and it should kind of follow through this reasonably nicer. So I'll hit exit sketch. Now let's try to do this for like the nth time. I'll designate center line and that'll grab the entire thing. I'll go back to profiles. Now oh, what is your problem? Because it would produce self-intersecting geometry. I disagree, but that happens. Okay, fine. If you're going to be a pain. Here, let's just edit this one here and kind of make it more rounded. I'm actually going to do something like this. If this doesn't work, I'll be a little bit upset. This should be fine to smart dimension if I just say that's like 100 and exit the sketch. Okay, come on, don't make too much of a liar out of me. Now if I hit center line. There we go. Okay, so now it's following that curve. I guess that previous one was just too much for it to handle. Uh, but now you can see that that center line is going to go entirely through every cross section of this shape here. So, I mean, this kind of almost looks like more of a nozzle shape, whereas if we unsuppress this one and suppress that one, this one was much more bulky just because we had a lot of those rigid regions to it. And I mean, even if we, uh, Oh, I don't think it actually has a way to, to smooth those out. So if you're doing things with regard to loft, you're going to want to make sure that any of those kind of outside patterns, unlike sweep, are more smooth, or else it's going to be much more rigid with how it makes those patterns there, or rather those edges. So those are two different ways that we can sort of create our shape. Um, if 
the outside has a lot of complexity to it, we might be more inclined to use a guided curve, whereas something with regard to kind of maintaining a general profile for that shape, we might want to use a center line in this instance, where it's kind of more direct and showing how our uh, general path at each point is going to be. Um, okay, let's see, what else do we have for the PowerPoint? Um, so I talked a little bit about that with regard to playing around with those dots. Uh, occasionally it might be either a green dot or a teal dot. Sometimes you might get some of both. I'm not entirely sure when it, uh, it designates which it gives you. Um, I typically like it if it's giving you a lot of those dots so you can kind of create and, and manipulate your dimensions a whole lot more. Because as we saw with some of these things, dragging around those dots across the edge is going to give you at least a little bit more control as to what's going on with your geometry. So now let's talk a little bit about start and end constraints. Um, and this will be one of the last topics that we start going through. Um, so start and end constraints, these are just ways, kind of as it implies, assigning some kind of uh, more intricacies to what's going on with regard to uh, the uh, what's happening at the beginning and what's happening at the end. So if you're if you're looking at the PowerPoint right now on this page, it's slide. 16, so uh, third from the last, it's basically showing that we have some kind of trapezoidal prism as our initial shape, and then some kind of a circular sketch elsewhere, uh, in, uh, just out in space. It kind of looks like it's not even associated with one of our three primary datum planes, or even a, uh, a datum plane that was created based upon one of those primaries. Kind of looks like it's almost at like a 45 or 30 degree angle uh, from the horizontal of the start of this uh, trapezoid looking shape. And then we go a little bit further into start and end constraints with regard to what you might expect. Uh, if you are playing with those. So the general options that we're going to see in those start and end constraints are going to be normal to profile, and then I know it says tangency to face, but uh, typically it's, I believe the option that it says more often than not has to do with uh, some kind of vector component to it. Uh, so that's a, I, I think it, it's still similar. It's giving some sort of like a, a direction and magnitude. We'll, we'll look at it here in just a second when we go from the PowerPoint back to SolidWorks. Um, but it's just a way to kind of, the start and end constraints are just a way to kind of get better or more control over what's going on with your, uh, your loft. Um, so we can see pretty much what we would expect, at least when we first started using the loft. If we're not assigning any sort of start or end constraints, it's really just going to take the quickest path there. Um, it's just going to link up corners with edges as best as it possibly can upon, uh, upon first assigning your loft. Um, if we start getting into some of the other options, such as it being normal to the profile, so I'm, I'm sure some of you probably already know because I've used it a couple times here and there and probably for some other engineering classes, but when we're talking about normal, we're just meaning that it is perpendicular to that surface. So if we have a normal to profile end constraint, that means that the uh, that the loft that it creates, that loft extrusion that it creates, Basically, the second that the next point it creates comes out, it needs to be normal to that end surface. Similarly, what you would expect if you choose normal to the profile for the start constraint, it's going to kind of rise up from the very top portion of the uh, of that trapezoidal prism first, and then it'll start kind of curving uh, as it goes. So, I mean, they both kind of look like faucets, but like if you're looking at the PowerPoint right now, but one of them kind of looks more like a shower head almost, while the other looks more like, like a faucet. Um, now, if you do normal from both, it's going to 
pretty much do what you would expect. It's going to make sure that it uh, has a has a flat side um, as it starts moving out from those base sketches, or rather the start sketch and the uh, end sketch. Uh, tangency to face. So that's really just saying, so I, I guess that is another option, and I, I haven't really played around with that that much. Tangency to face is, I'm guessing that's really just saying that we might have another face that we would like it to start kind of making a smooth curve on. So pretty much every single time I, I make those uh, tangencies between, say, an arc and another uh, just edge, in my sketches, that's essentially what we're doing only more on an extrusion basis. It's just making sure that when it goes from that original shape that it started with to the loft extrusion, it's smooth as it goes. Um, and you can see that both on like the, the last, like on the, on the right side, if you're looking at the, at the PowerPoint right now, um, and then directional vectors, that's going to give you a bit more control as to how your uh, how your constraints or how how the beginning or the end of this loft base is kind of interacting with the rest of it. Um, so I, I believe it just allows you to kind of use like more vector components. So we'll play around with it a little bit. We won't go really too deep into it just because there's a lot of factors with regard to those start and end constraints. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to oop, create something far more basic. So I'm just going to create two sketches, kind of what they did there, just so it, it might make things a little bit easier if we kind of just play around with the settings and, and see what each of them do when we're going through our loft. So I'll just make a basic extrusion and just to kind of maintain what it's showing on the PowerPoint, I'll make this kind of look pretty similar. So we'll have a, a very slight draft going on uh, to our shape. I'm actually going to make this 20. I'll make this 50. So looks pretty darn good for the most part. Um, and then I'm actually, yeah, so I'll make another plane starting from the right plane. And then I should be able to, maybe if I select a reference like that, uh, whatever. How about this? I'll create actually a plane from this side, so it's kind of more at a, at a slant. And I'll flip the offset, and then I'll make it go a little bit further out. So let's do like 50, there we go. And then I'll make this plane even bigger so I kind of know where I'm sketching. So that looks reasonable. I will create a circle. So I'm not going to go too far off from what the PowerPoint has, because uh, God knows I might screw it up. <laughs> and then I'll save this as say 100. Then we'll see if we can use these two things as our, uh, um, I'll save this like 250, as like our sketch planes. So one of these things, and this is actually a really good example now that I'm thinking about it, because one of these things is actually starting from a geometry that we already have. Uh, so not just a very basic sketch plane, and another one is a sketch plane. So I'm going to select loft. One of those will be that face, and the other will be that face over there. So it's already yelling at me a little bit, but that's just because things were kind of thrown off. Now, why are you, oh, I see. So this is an instance where I would probably play around with the green dots a little bit. I typically like to have it be kind of underneath or rather the edge that's closest or the vertex that's closest going to, if we're going to a circle in this case, kind of like in a very similar location, almost as if I projected this circle onto or rather lined this circle up like axially with this face. They'd be in the same general location. You see that this is kind of at the top right. This is at the bottom right. So it's going to make the most immediate connection. Um, and now let's actually play around with our start and end constraints. So now, okay, so there's more options than I even thought there were. Uh, learning as I go, apparently. So if we choose normal to the profile, 
well, it's already going to kind of expand that extrusion outward before it starts making that curve. If I play around with this a little bit, it's not going to change things at least too much, but you can see a lot of those lines from those edges are shifting. It actually gives us a whole lot of other uh, details and, and sort of um, things to play around with. So we can here, this is reversing the direction so I can make it that it would be, I'm not entirely sure what that even does, but it's zero regardless. So if I start increasing the angle, it apparently won't like that. But it's something like two degrees. I'm not really sure where this is originating from, or maybe it's kind of twisting it uh, axially around that, that um, uh, around that uh, that vector. Um, clearly, I haven't really played around with this as much as I probably should have, uh, which that's fine. So let's just say that this sticks with zero there in that case. If I choose tangent to face, we can see that it kind of thinned out near this direction. And then if I actually hit OK on this, we can see that even though it's two different curves, it really nicely goes right in from this curve into that one. So they are aligned fairly nicely. So now we have, yet again, something that kind of looks almost like a, I don't know, telephone-ish kind of shape. Weird thing. Um, and we can play around with some of the, the tangency settings here as well, uh, or curvature to face. So this one's even giving us a whole lot more options. So now we can actually see that we, we can play around with, uh, with these dots a whole lot more, and it'll actually kind of uh, adjust things appropriately. So even if I play around with that right there, kind of thinned out this edge a little bit, it made it thinner, but it's still kind of as wide as it was before. Um, we can also play around with the end conditions as well. So let's actually go back to the tangency to face one right now. So it's kind of pulling inward, going in the same exact direction as this straight face on this side. And let's see what we have here. So I can do a normal to profile, and then it'll just push it out further, kind of more towards the actual uh, geometry that we started with. So it's kind of more of a, uh, a, a nice curve that starts out. As you can see, this kind of purple directional vector is really giving you at least a little bit more information as to what's happening. So this directional vector is showing you the immediate direction of, uh, I guess you could say the lines or the extrusion from that plane. So it's always going to be normal to or perpendicular to that surface that we start with. So there's a lot of settings here within the start and end constraints. Kind of a big reason why I don't want to get too much into it because I know that there's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of crazy stuff that kind of where you're able to make these sorts of little adjustments is not as precise as a lot of stuff that we've been working with other than just eyeballing it and seeing, yeah, that looks like they're in line. That looks like they're in line. I'm not going to assign or give an assignment where it's like that, where it's it's so ambiguous because I don't necessarily think that that's fair. Um, but the last topic is, is really just going through kind of what you might expect, which is going to be a loft cut now. Um, so loft cut, just as what we've had uh, with pretty much <laughs> just about all of our features by this point, um, instead of extruding, we're going to chop out part of our shape. Um, and just as what you'd expect, it doesn't have to be uniform throughout. I can choose two different uh, geometries here. I mean, even if I literally just select it right off the bat, a lofted cut, and I kind of select both of these, it's going to kind of cut out parts of it that I don't necessarily want here. Uh, but it is a way that I can kind of just create that geometry or create a cut like that right off the bat. Maybe I want there to be some sort of hollow region here on the inside. So for something like that, I would probably be more inclined to try to, uh, uh, what is it? Um, to try to create almost like a center line. Because we can see we could create a center line that goes through a shape that looks like this. So I'm actually just going to close out of that and... Uh, better yet, I'm going to create kind of a smaller region on both of these faces that uh, entails exactly what I want. So I'm going to sketch on this. 
And why the heck not? Let's make this kind of funky. So instead, this will have the circular shape, and that'll have the square shape. I'm saying this now as though I have a super good grasp of what this might do, but it might still yell at me, so I guess we'll see. Uh, so I want to sketch on this face. Let me reorient myself a little bit. I'm actually going to go normal to this. There we go. Let's see if I can make this square here, right in the center. So I'll say that those are equal. That should not have done that. Why is it doing that? <laughs> oh, not even on the right sketch plane, what the heck. Okay, come on, let's cooperate. There we go. Now, I'll try to do the same thing. Make just a tiny box here. I'll say that these are equal to each other. And then let's try to see if we can create a center line that goes between them. So same deal. I can use that front plane since it goes right through both of them. Um, I am set to sketch on that one, so I'll go normal to it. I'll see if I can go right about there. Why are you here? How about this? There we go. So now I can do it appropriately. Uh, I'm actually going to just try out like maybe an arc. If that doesn't work, perhaps a spline. So that actually works pretty good. So we can see that it's intersecting uh, fairly well right at that location, and I believe it's also intersecting right there. So let's see if we can loft this properly. Actually, I don't know why, but it got rid of the circle that was there. I'm just going to say that this is like 2.5, so kind of small. So we'll exit out, we'll go to features, and now we'll do a lofted cut. So the profiles that I'm going to select are this bottom circle here and this top square up here. And I mean, it would cut directly from there, but as we said, I want to do a center line. I wanted to, generally speaking, follow that curve. And we can see it's actually doing things fairly nicely. I might want to make some slight adjustments with this just so that it behaves. So something more like that. And now if I hit OK, so obviously we can't really tell that there's much of anything there. But if I do a cross section, we can more easily see kind of the profile of that shape going on. So we can see that it's going from some kind of a circle. These faces are kind of weird, but then it's going to gradually go to a square uh, shape on that opposite face. So in a case like this with that center line curve, uh, I don't think I had anything uh, defined there. I'm actually going to see if um, if I could define both of them. So let's actually just check to see if that's even remotely possible. So if I sketch this and I just say that this has some given dimension to it, it's kind of more of a proof of concept. Oh, I see what's going on. I'm on the wrong sketch. I want this one. Sketch, smart dimension. Oh my god, come on. There we go. So let's say this is like 25. And let's say that hopefully that didn't throw that off center. No, it didn't. Um. Let's just give a dimension to this circle down here as well. Let's see if it actually still works. I can never really remember if 
guide curves is as rigid with its behavior as, or, or if uh, center line curves are as rigid as they are with uh, guide curves. Uh, so I'll exit out of that. That should, it's not fully defined, but that's totally okay. We were really just checking to see if having a dimension to the profile itself made a difference. So if I do a lofted cut now, and I say you to not that, to you, and then I choose a center line of this guy, it appears to still work. Cool. Um, okay, it's a little bit wonky. <laughs> as it's apparently showing here. So I would, kind of going back to our earlier discussion, I would I would try to make sure that certain things are not actually fully defined, um, and then it would actually uh, behave appropriately. I think if I simply get rid of, none of the items could be selected, got it. If I go into this, and then I just delete that dimension and then exit, Possibly, if I do the same for this, it might rebuild that uh, that shape appropriately. Emphasis on might. Okay, not terribly. Um, so I, I guess rule of thumb for both guide curves and um, center line curves. If you're going to define anything or making sure that anything is defined, make sure that the distance from a reference point is defined. So in this case, this circle here was lined up with the origin, um, as was the end points of this center line curve. So you probably could assign a dimension to the center line curve as well. You could just say, hey, it has a radius of whatever. Um, this as well, so this, square profile, you could likely say it has some sort of relation to the, uh, what is it, to the origin. Um, but beyond that, you wouldn't really need to do any sort of other crazy business by uh, defining things. Uh, because C, oh, I still had that one selected. Oh, that was just the loft cut, yeah, yeah. So I mean, if I, if I try doing the loft cut now, so with this and that, and then one more time we do a center line after I kind of removed some of those dimensions that were there. Now it actually makes that curve uh, a whole lot more manageable, much more kind of closely related to what we actually wanted it to be. So I kind of wanted to say, well, this is at the bottom left. So I want this one to be more aligned with the top left, just to make it kind of look a little bit nicer. And if we click on that, obviously it was something simpler like this, or more ambiguous with this, those those green or teal dots really don't matter that much. Uh, they're pretty they're pretty chill. You don't really need to mess around with them too much uh, with a more ambiguous shape that looks like this. And if we remove that cross section, then we really can't tell, but we know it has a very complex. Uh, cut out in the center. Um, and, and just as what you'd expect, I can do this with other stuff as well. I mean, if I suppress this, heck, even if I suppress that as well, just so I can kind of create maybe another very basic geometry, kind of similar to how I, I showed you guys the sweep cut a little bit earlier. I'll show you a loft cut, um, just a very, very basic one. So let's just say we have some kind of a, oop, that's not right. Some kind of a rectangular shape to it. And we'll make sure that this is a rectangular prism. Very uh, basic with all my dimensions here pretty much make it the same thing, make it a little bit bigger. And then I'm just going to create two different profiles on each side of this, and then I can just cut it. Uh, I can just kind of create that sort of uh, loft cut. So let's say I just sketch on this face here. So 
I'll do something. Eh, I want to make it a little bit crazier. <laughs> See, I keep saying that, and it's it's just not going to work one of these days. Uh, so let's say I do something that kind of looks like that, and maybe I'll do something that looks like. Something like that. I kind of want it more centered a little bit like that. Um, I kind of want to bump this up, make it a bit higher. So I'll say, hey, you, you, be a midpoint. So it's really only going to carve out just this kind of shape, but it'll be more rounded on that side. Um, and then hopefully this works. <laughs> uh, so I will do a lofted cut. I want to go from this profile here to this slot profile over there. And geez, it looks very strange, but that's totally fine. Oh god, that's not what I wanted. Uh, okay, I guess I'll leave that as is. Or maybe I'll switch it down there. This is why I'm not giving you guys an assignment, because this part right here is just a massive pain. Uh, and I know I wouldn't like doing something like that, uh, but this enough is kind of a proof of concept that we're, we're really just saying, hey, we're, we're starting off with some geometry here um, or some base geometry. We'll have two differing sketches on either side of it, and then it's just cutting out some sort of a path or channel in between them. If I wanted to, I could definitely move this down and it would be on the inside of the shape, but I think it's a little bit easier for you guys to see exactly what's going on, because some of these paths are actually fairly nice, like this bottom side and this bottom side over here. I could sketch on this, I, I believe, if I want to. Yeah, it allows me to sketch on it, because it's already registering that as a nice flat face. This here, not so much. I, I really have absolutely no options available to me to sketch on that. And even if I go to sketch and hit the sketch button, it don't work. <laughs> it's not working at all. This right here, you can kind of see it's starting to curve a little bit. Almost kind of like how the Mobius strip does it. Uh, and similarly for this, this is kind of like a chunk of a, like a, of a cone almost. So you want to be a little bit careful if you would ever try to use one of these faces as a uh, as a region to use another sketch on. Yeah, I, I would not recommend it just because it's going to create a lot of strange geometry that hopefully that's what you intended. Um, but this is a much more difficult sketch plane to create uh, or even use. Um, that's really about all that I got with regard to the features that we're talking about today. I am more than happy to go through anything that we discussed because I know that like sweep and loft both have a metric ton of options uh, and all sorts of different stuff that you could do with them. And in and of themselves, they're kind of trickier features anyway they're they're probably on the more advanced end of of the features that we would even be working with um, and and that's half the reason why i'm not giving an in-class assignment dedicated to either of them i mean definitely not dedicated to the loft i'm just not giving one dedicated to the suite because we have a homework assignment that's for it um, and we do have our exam coming up next week our first exam um, so if anybody has any questions about any of this stuff so far, shout it out. Because um, that's really about it with regard to the lecture today. Uh, and I know I went, I, I had mentioned also that if anybody has any questions about homework as well, we can talk about that uh, as well. Can you go through one more time how to close a sketch? Uh, so just having like, yeah, yeah, just having like a closed sketch, you mean? Yeah, I, I guess I don't really understand what that means. Sure, yeah, yeah. So when I say closed, it, I, I'm not saying anything like, or at least I'm not trying to make it sound like too cryptic or crazy. Really closed just means that there's no openings to it. So like if I, 
if I'm just going to sketch on this face, right now there's two ways that I know that this is a closed shape. One way is because it's darkened, it kind of has that darker look to it. Even if I kind of sketched it out over here, it's a lot easier to see. You can kind of see that more like bluish purple region uh, that is uh, sectioned off. If I get rid of one of those, now it's open. This has no, uh, you couldn't use this right here as a, as a profile for your sweep or loft, just because there's nothing to it. There's no closed shape aspect to this. So I mean, okay. even if I did something like that, now it's closed because you can see that color change. So that color change is, is probably one of your biggest indicators. Ooh. Nice. Um, I know I mentioned it as well in that little, or rather that long post that I made earlier. Uh, and I talked about it just a little bit at the beginning of class. There is an extra credit opportunity. So what I'll do right now is I guess I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, I hope I posted that on Canvas. I probably didn't because I said that I might post it either tonight or tomorrow. Let me open that up and I'll kind of show you guys. So as I said, it's extra credit. It's not gonna count against any of you guys. It can only help you or count for you. As soon as I find out where the heck I put it. Oh my God, what's wrong with me? Here it is. Alrighty, I should have it up. Yes, I do. Okay. Okay, so I have for you guys as some extra credit, um, this geometry here. So kind of looks like a door handle a little bit, by and large, pretty correct dimensions, not even super intentional. Just as a point or a hint right off the bat, you're going to want to use your sweep, uh, or rather your, your, your loft for this. Um, the geometry is fairly complex. As you can see, I mean, just from this cross section here. Um, and unfortunately, this is also a factor as to why I'm not doing an in-class assignment with regard to this, or a homework assignment with regard to this, is because this is super difficult to dimension because it's such a complex shape when you're looking at it. It has this very kind of complex curve to the bottom of it. This curve right here, this is not something that you're going to be able to easily accomplish using something other than your loft. Um, and then just for a little bit of extra complexity here, we have some screw holes down here at the bottom. So there's already a call out for it. It's telling you that there's five of these uh, 1.78 screw holes with five millimeter depth. It has a uh, countersink radius of 3.02. So it's an 82 degrees one. So as we can see right here, CSK for a number zero flathead machine screw. So you should have a lot of information here. I'll point this one thing out that 82 degrees, if we kind of remember information regarding uh, using the whole wizard, that's going to be important information to kind of think about. Um, other than that, you're, I, I guess the best way that I can kind of give you guys any hint whatsoever is you have a couple profiles that you can see. You have one here, your base, you have one here, kind of at one kind of midsection, and you also have one here at the very end. I will post the PDF for this very soon, in just a, a couple of minutes, hopefully, um, just so that you guys can kind of think about it and, and look at it and scratch your heads over it a little bit. Uh, and this is just giving you a little bit more information about the screws themselves, so kind of giving you a little bit of information about the depth of it. So definitely look at that and pay attention to what is going on there. Like I said, you guys don't have to do this if you don't want to, but it's a great way of kind of showing that you have a, a really good grasp of how to use uh, how to use loft. Um, 
I mean, as before, I'm not going to make this like a pass fail kind of thing. Like you get points or you don't. There's obviously going to be like uh, like partial credit components to this. Um, so I, I mean, by doing it, as long as there's some reasonable looking features going on there and, and everything by and large looks to be about what it should be, um, mass included, uh, it, it should be, I mean, you guys, you guys could get some, some pretty reasonable points for it. Um, okay, good. I didn't screw anything up. So what I'll do right now is I'm going to close out of this. So hopefully none of you are, are starting on it already. Um, and I'm going to, I'll upload the PDF to Canvas. Um, and I'll try to make an assignment for it tonight. So because Canvas is super cool, uh, and I mean that very uh, sarcastically, I have no idea right off the top of my head how to make something an extra credit assignment. <laughs> uh, so between now and whenever I actually make it in a, a legitimate assignment where you can make a submission, um, you guys can kind of look at it and play with it and try to make it. Uh, so let me upload it in the files real quick. And it'll just be in the base folder, so it's not going to be in the homework assignments. It'll be just kind of out in the open. Cool. All right, so that's uploaded. Um, I think I briefly mentioned it either in the announcement or at the beginning of lecture or both. Uh... This extra credit thing will be due either the day of the exam or like that night of the exam, kind of like at midnight, um, or like the day before. Um, I mean, heck, uh, honestly, trying this out and kind of playing around with it would be a good way of uh, just being able to, to kind of show your understanding of how to use Loft. Because it is a complex uh, feature, so I mean, it's it's it'll be great practice. And I know I kind of briefly mentioned it before, but but there will be at least a question that deals with or talks a little bit about loft on the exam. So I want to make sure that you guys at least have a good understanding of it, so you don't walk into the exam metaphorically, uh, and you're just like, I have no idea how to create something that looks like that. Hey, Ethan. What's up? Um, I was a little bit late. Sorry. Um, did you happen to go over the format of the exam? Uh, I haven't gone over the format of it. Um, so I can I can just tell you guys all right now what I'm at least thinking. Um, okay. <laughs> don't worry. Uh, all you guys are in the same boat as me. I'm trying to figure out what the heck I'm doing for the exam anyway. Um, what I'm thinking about doing for the exam is probably around three or so questions or three or so geometries that I would like you guys to make. Um, and all of these uh, all of these geometries will have two, three, maybe, or give or take, uh, specific features that I would like you guys to use for that, um, or, or rather, a couple different features that we have learned about that are, I guess you might say, the the optimal way of, of creating it. By and large, I don't care how you guys do it. Um, if, if you do something that is not how I would have done it, or more innovative, or perhaps maybe I'll look at it after and I'll say, holy crap, that was so much easier. I banged my head against my desk for about 20 minutes trying to figure out a good way of doing it. And one of you guys ends up figuring out like an easier way. More power to you. Like I, I have no issue with that. Um, but by and large, I'm going to do it in some way that I've kind of come up with creating those sorts of parts that incorporate a couple different features in each. Um, and if you guys are able to, to kind of figure out uh, another way of doing that or a better way of doing that, then you're you're more than welcome to figure out how to do it however you like. Um, 
also I and I I just want to revisit this. I know that the uh, I know that the syllabus says that you guys need to have your webcams on. You know, thinking about it now, and that's really stupid. So I really don't care if you guys have your webcams on, honestly. Uh, like simplest way that I can put it, just don't cheat. I don't know how you guys really would, unless you're like collaborating with one another. But just like try not to, please. <laughs> it's really the most I can say on that matter. Just don't do it. It's not really going to get you really anywhere, and most of what I plan on making isn't going to come from some online resource. Like, I'm going to probably end up scratching my head and trying to figure out about three different parts this weekend um, as to what to give you. So, I mean, maybe you might find something online that's kind of I, it was inspired by, but by and large, it's not going to be anything that I just explicitly stripped from some other resource. So it's not like you're going to be able to just download a SolidWorks file or or kind of find a, a quick and dirty guide on how to do it. Um, so, I mean, that's <laughs> that should be at least a, a, a way that all of you guys should be at least reasonably practicing academic honesty and all that jazz. Um, so yeah, let's, let's just go with that. I, I mean, I at least think that that's reasonably fair with regard to it. If you guys have any ideas or concerns about that, definitely let me know if you think that, I mean, I don't, I don't think that that's too much. Um, hopefully it, I mean, I'd rather it be at least a little bit too easy than too hard, <laughs> but so that's why I'm going with, with around three three parts um but i mean if you if you guys have thoughts as to those sorts of things you can kind of let me know i'd rather you talk to me and say that you're kind of struggling with regard to figuring out what sort of uh features to use or how to approach certain problems and then you and i can have a discussion about that and maybe kind of fast track those sorts of things maybe talk about little tips and tricks as to how to look at a geometry and recognize, oh, I should be using a rib here, or oh, I should be using a uh, revolve here as opposed to creating an extrusion or just a basic extrusion. Oh, I should use sweep here because it's a really complex curve. I don't know how to create that shape otherwise. Like little things like that where uh, you and I can, or like any of you guys can, can talk to either each other or talk to me about it and we can kind of come to an understanding as to what's a good way of attacking certain problems or certain geometries on how to create them. Um, I think maybe next week, if possible, uh, sometime before the exam, maybe like either Tuesday or Wednesday night or possibly even in the mornings. I'll be hanging around uh, in one of the other calls just to make sure that you guys, if you do have any questions, you can just hop right in. I mean, as you guys already know, I'm very available. You guys can always send me a message either via Discord or Canvas, um, and, and we can sort out any of those concerns. Uh, so does anybody have, at least right now, any questions with regard to I guess the exam will kind of just go down the list. Uh, lecture material during the test. Um, eh, like I, I prefer you guys not to. Um, I, I think it would be a lot better if you guys kind of had the understanding that all right, we're, we're going to approach this and, and kind of see how we tackle a given problem. Um, so let's do no PowerPoint, so no open book, I guess you could say. Um, the way that I look at it, I want to make sure that everybody who's coming into the exam has at least some tool in their arsenal how to tackle a problem. Or at the very least, they can look at something and they could say, I could use extrude i could use a revolve there what perhaps might be the easiest option so let's try to do no notes here i mean obviously if 
if things are that difficult or, or if it calls for something like that, we'll make accommodations for like the next exam. But let's try to let's try to do no notes or no lecture material. Um, the main thing that I want out of this is I want you guys to be confident in your abilities to make these geometries without relying on on a PowerPoint. Uh, and I, I, I don't like using the word relying on, but I want you guys to be able to, to kind of look at something and, and just say, OK, I have a pretty good idea on what I should do and then kind of play with it a little bit and then say, OK, here's here's a good way that I can tackle this problem. So let's let's try to go from that understanding. And that's that's kind of why I want to try to be as as open as and as available as I can for you guys. So if you do have questions about those sorts of things, you'll be able to just ask them and, and clarify right then and there. Um, it'll be a lot more effective teaching if if you guys kind of think about it and reason your way through it as opposed to using a PowerPoint. Anything else with regard to the exam? So um, for the exam, do we have the entire class period to, to do it or is it uh, a more restricted time limit? Uh, I don't know what the heck the syllabus says about like the time limit. Um, honestly, depending on the difficulty of the exam and, and how I'm seeing things, I might check up on you guys. Like, obviously I'll still be in here, but I might check up on you guys like kind of uh, like halfway through or, and or just based upon like if people are leaving the leaving the call at the time and kind of see how you guys are doing it. I'm more than willing to give extra time. Like if I'm completely honest, I'm more than willing to give you guys until midnight that same day, uh, but I, I hope that the three hours will be sufficient enough. Um, so, I, I mean, way that I look at it, we'll go the entire period. If people still need time, we can keep going. I'm, I'm not going to be really hard and fast with regard to the, the time frame. Oh, okay, thank you. I was just kind of worried because, you know, some lab classes, not this one, but, you know, like other lab classes will be like, your test is only an hour, so. We've got yeah, even the three hours uh, point for me, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, in in the nicest way possible, screw that. I I think that that's stupid, and I don't think that that's really acceptable for for a class like this. I think that, I mean, obviously, and I'm not saying this to be rude. Uh, I'm saying this because I've been in literally all your guys' shoes before, because I'm sure all of y'all know this by it now, but like, if you're getting to a point and you're working on like the first or second one and you're still sitting there like, crap, I have no idea how to do this one right there, then it's it's probably not going to work out for, for that one. So just try your best for that one and move on to the next one. I'd rather you guys have like submit all of the parts and maybe there's little bits and pieces on one or two of them that are not as good. Uh, or not exactly what they should be, as opposed to doing like one and a half and then like the third one you do, it's just like, well, didn't get to that one. That's like a third of my points that I'm just not going to get. So I, I'd rather you guys just do all of them, a little bit of all of them, and, and make sure that you have something to, to submit there. Um, and yeah, the, the exam is, is next week next Thursday night. Um, what else? What else, guys? Questions about anything, whether it be the exam, whether it be anything that maybe I went super quickly over for the uh, lecture tonight, anything in the past that you might still need some clarification for. I am all ears. All right. Um, well, I mean, I'll I'll probably still stick around till about eight o'clock. You guys are totally good to go if you want to. I, I mean, obviously, if people still have questions like beyond that time, I'll I'll stick around till eight thirty. You guys want me to, uh, but I I don't have anything more for you guys. So fire your questions away. Otherwise, 
you're good to go, but I'll be here for another 15 or so minutes and, unless nobody is, is still here. Cool. Thanks, Ethan. Take it easy, guys. Hey, I got a question for you, Ethan. Yeah, let me let me just answer answer Kyle real quick. Uh, yes, there is no yeah. in class assignment today. There's only going to be homework, and there's just that uh, extra credit opportunity if you guys are so inclined. Like I said, you you can obviously start on that extra credit assignment. I I just put it into Canvas. The homework should be there as well. I did not make a freaking assignment for homework five. So I'm an idiot, so I'll do that. So you guys can start working on it, but uh, you won't be able to submit it quite yet. Uh, I'll get that sorted away before before tonight ends. Uh, what were you going to say, Ross? Uh, so uh, I've been working on the uh, homework. Yeah. With uh, trying to do the loft on the very top. Um, basically, what I'm trying to figure out is for some reason on mine, it keeps... Like the arch is nice and clean on the inside, um, but the outer edge one, it gets like this is real wonky kind of deal for it. Do you need to do two guidelines in order to get it to stay nice and smooth all the way around, or is is this for the, uh, this for the, the top, right? Yeah, the top arch on the padlock. I I got all the dimensions in. I got it to flow over good, mm -hmm. but then it just. It just so, yeah, so basically, um, the nice thing about that is that you th – think about the other thing that we were actually playing around with earlier. Um, we were talking about loft, but we also talked about sweep. So sweep might be a better option for something like that because you have a uniform profile across a path. Um, I guess if, oh, okay. if, you're, if you're kind of thinking about, like, logistically when to use one versus the other if you have some sort of strange profile or not even strange profile but if you have uh one profile becoming a different profile at another cross section um, or perhaps at like maybe the top and the bottom have completely different profiles to them then that's a situation where you're more typically going to want to use loft if you have something that is generally speaking uniform across a given path that's when you're going to want to use something like sweep so i mean if i if i kind of just like really quickly demonstrate it um on probably a simpler example than uh than what i was doing with like say the spiral i'm gonna get rid of this guy because i don't need it and i want to suppress this real quick um I don't think that the uh, that it needs to be, or rather that the path needs to be directly at the center of whatever your um, whatever your profile is. I think it could be slightly off center, but generally speaking, you're going to want it to be uh, at the center of that. So let's just create a path first. So something that's super random. It has some kind of cusps in it so places where it's not as nice and then it has other parts that do end up curving a bit and i'll do something like that so we'll say that these two things are tangent to each other so that's a nice smooth curve this right here is also going to be a nice smooth curve but then it has these kind of more clunky parts right in the very beginning where it has some cusps so i'll exit out of that and then, so that is, was part of our top plane. So I want to create something from our right plane. So now I'm going to, honestly, I'm going to create something that's probably even a little bit more strange. So I'll create like a slot that we could have here. And then what's nice is that it's already where it should be. So I shouldn't have to assign anything to these two, but it's always kind of good practice to make sure that the pierce relation is uh, assigned between those between your closed profile and your open sketch. Then when I exit out of that, if I go back to features and I do a sweep, then I can just click on this and it understands that it's a closed profile. 
when I click on, come on, that, it should create things more appropriately. So in this case, basically think of that, uh, that middle as, as just our center line. So it's kind of, the, the path generally speaking is going to be uh, the center line um, of our closed profile. That's really all that's going on there. So I mean, if you wanted something that kind of curves back around, then you could do that as well. The, the main point here that I'm kind of trying to illustrate is that that metal curved portion is going to be much more easily done if you use a sweep as opposed to a loft. Um, you likely could do a loft. Uh, it's going to be a bit harder to do. Now I'm tempted to try it. Yeah, the, the loft the loft gives it a real wonky shape, but the, yeah, the sweep it, it will. Yeah, sweep made it nice and clean. It all. It, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. All right. Um, in fairness, you, you could probably do both. It's just going to be a bigger headache doing one versus the other. I mean, honestly, to illustrate that, because what you're going to have to do is not only are you going to have to create and make sure that both of those two profiles are off-centered enough from each other, but you're also going to have to make sure that, like, that the start and the end constraints are normal. Like they're like they they're normal to each other. Or they're normal to the sketch, or else it's going to basically just be. It, it's going to look super weird. I'm sure you already know by now, ha having kind of tested it out. Uh, so I mean, if I do something, I have no idea. Let me just try it out. So I mean, if I kind of hit those two, say this is like 15. Let me make this a little smaller. I'm going to say this is like 10. And then on the same, or not the same plane, but on right plane. Hold on, I'm disoriented now. Let's do front plane. Yeah, let's sketch like another circle on like the front plane. Well, then we can go up some amount. This one would also be 10. So I'll just assign that as such. I can smart dimension it. Sure, let's say that that's 50. These are different diameters. This one should be half the size. There we go. So exit sketch. Yeah, and technically I could do a loft between the two. So I could say, hey you, hey you. And kind of what we expect, it's just gonna like zoom it right to that region. But if I do normal to profile and normal to profile, it kind of assumes the appropriate shape. You'd probably also have to do a guide curve for something like this as well. If you were to try to make the uh, make the make the metal lock portion of it. The nice thing is that you can literally just mirror this though. If I want, I can just say. Oh, yeah, it's a loft. Uh, what? <laughs> that I don't necessarily understand. Oh, well, it does weird things sometimes. Yeah, it would be a little bit more complicated if you were trying to use the, the loft for that portion of the lock. Hey, Ethan. What's up? Um, I have a question. I just wanted to know, I might have missed this. Um, where do we submit the extra credit when we're done with it? Yeah, I, I haven't actually made that quite yet. So um, just hold on to it. I will make sure that you have something for both the homework assignment, because I haven't done that yet as well. I guess in the meantime, yeah. I can, I can fire, right? a, a submission for both things on, on Canvas. Uh, so just hold on to it for the time being. Um, okay, I'm kind okay. of still just trying to figure out how to actually like put in extra credit related stuff into Canvas because Canvas is super intelligent. And I mean that very sarcastically. Uh, <laughs> so I'll figure that out over the next like 24 hours. And then there will be a place where you guys can submit it. Okay. Sounds good. Cool. 
All right, thanks. No worries. And I'll put up um, something. I had a question inside. about homework four. Sure. What's up? So for the bottom, I don't exactly know what it is. Is it like a rib? So it is going to be a rib. Let me pull it up and, and just kind of get an idea of what the heck I made because my memory okay. is failing me. There we go. Okay. So yes. Um, Basically, and, and it's kind of hard to see really what's going on there, but essentially what's happening is that if you look at the very bottom left image, what we have is some sort of circular profile, and then we have, it kind of almost looks like a bullseye, I guess you could say, where we have vertical and horizontal lines to it. Um, the general idea for that is that kind of like how we how we use our rib function we're going to and it, it doesn't matter whether it's open or closed because you can definitely tell if you're going to create a circle like that you're going to have a closed portion of this profile so that's totally okay but the lines on the sides those don't need to close anything off um, so i i guess my hint would be you're going to want to shell this first, or at least before creating that bottom kind of bullseye rib shape to it. Um, okay, so we should select the face on the bottom and then shell that, and then go from there when adding in the circle. Because what I started doing was I selected the bottom and I like created a sketch that looked kind of like that, like with the lines and mm -hmm. like a rectangle in a circle. And then I hit rib and it was like what do you want me to do <laughs> it, it was probably a little bit too complicated for it yeah so yeah so so if if you shell it first basically what's already going to happen is you're already going to get the exterior thin profile around it that's not going to be a cause of concern um, you're mostly creating the rib just so you can kind of create that more complex uh extrusion at the at the bottom of the shape uh, the one thing that i would say if you haven't done your shell quite yet is remember what i talked about last week as well how order does matter when you're talking about your shell or when you're doing shell so i mean even if i, I mean heck i can do it for something like this if i shell this right now from this face and then I make this like oh, one millimeter. Oh yeah, I remember what you're saying. Yeah, because yeah. I shelled it right now and my little circles came out of the top. So that means that I had to do like an extrusion for like the rectangles to make it like this um, rectangular prism thingy. Yeah. And then shell it and then add the circles on top. Exactly. Because if, and... I, if I do something now or if I, so how I've shelled this shape right now, of course, if I cut this open and cross-section it the correct way, we can see that it just, I mean, it has a profile that we would expect. However, if I kind of made this a little bit more complicated, or rather, even if I suppressed this, or better yet, I'm just going to delete it for now. I'll delete that, and then I'm going to create just a very, very simple geometry here at the very bottom. Something like that. I'm not even going to go into too much detail. And not that much of an extrusion, that's for sure. Something like 10. And if I shell it now, it's also going to shell out this little shaft that I added to it as well. As opposed yeah. to if I had done it in reverse, if I had shelled it and then I created the extrusion, this would still be solid on the inside here. Um, so, as I said, order matters. That's one thing to Absolutely. kind of just be a little bit aware of. Okay, so I'm going to try shelling it first, and then I still don't really understand rib that much. Okay. Um, so let me get to the circle part, and then I'll come back to you in like three minutes. Just okay, give me a sec no to worries. I'll be... Catch up. Okay, thank you. And I think I, I briefly mentioned this earlier. I mean, I know the entire class isn't here, but I'll probably send it uh, a, uh, what is it? Like a, an announcement out maybe sometime this weekend. 
I'll probably just be hanging out in the, uh, like in one of the, the study room calls or, or something sometime next week, likely either Tuesday or Wednesday night or like early afternoon, just in case anybody has any questions, kind of like a faux office hours, um, just because it'll be a little bit easier if anybody just wants to like drop in uh, and ask any questions as opposed to sending off an email. Um, I at least assume that <laughs> is a bit easier for, for most of you guys.